So speciation can happen gradually over time, or sometimes it happens very quickly. And we call those fits and starts. So the person that kind of coined this concept of punctuated equilibrium was our friend Stephen Jay Gould, who we listened to in a previous lecture. So let's let's listen to Stephen Jay Gould talk about punctuated equilibrium and the consequences of that. Now, Stephen Jay Gould, in our guts, we probably all know that evolutionary theory is right and that we did evolve from primates. But in modern history, the absence of kind of any tangible evidence of ongoing evolution uh, makes the whole theory a little bit abstract, I think, for, for the cynic. I, I don't accept your premise. Why do you think there's no evidence of ongoing well, evolution? Mean, over over the coffee table chatter, the skeptics will always say, you know, where, where are the Cro-Magnon men? I, I don't see any kind of evidence that there's a continuing You mean with respect to human beings, first of all, we're surrounded with evidence of continuing evolution. We just have to look at our dogs and our cereal plants. After all, humans are fed primarily by eight cereal crops, all of which are grasses and all of which are profoundly different from what they were hundreds and certainly thousands of years ago, and there are historical records for all of this. Geneticists throughout the world do experiments on fruit flies and their laboratory bottles and on bacteria on their agar plates. There's abundant surrounding evidence of evolution at the small scale that occurs over time spans of decades to hundreds of years. There's no appreciable evolution in the sense of directional change of human beings because you wouldn't expect there to be. We're a very large species of four to five billion people living all over the world. Entities like that don't change. They tend to be quite stable for long periods of time. So in fact, I think what you see on this planet today is exactly what you would expect if evolution were so, as indeed it is. In, uh, in the essay, Dinosaur in a, in a Haystack, in, in the book, Dinosaur mm -hmm. in a Haystack, I mean, above and beyond telling us about the fallacy sometimes of using theory to guide observation, I mean, you defend the notion that that perhaps the dinosaurs became extinct through an extraterrestrial accident, a meteorite or whatever. I mean, are we to believe that without that accident that maybe the dinosaurs would still be roaming and we'd still be in trees? Is, is evolution that accidental, that random? I think that's almost certainly so. There are no absolutes in the contingent science of history, but look, dinosaurs had been dominant creatures of terrestrial environments for what, about 150 million years this extraterrestrial object did hit. There's some debate as to whether it's the chief cause of the death of dinosaurs. I think it probably was. But mammals, contrary to what a lot of people think, did not evolve towards the end of the dinosaurs' reign or after the extinction. Mammals evolved at the same time as dinosaurs. Throughout that 150 million years, mammals were always around, and they never got any bigger than this. They were tiny little maximally rat-sized creatures living in the nooks and crannies of a dinosaur's world. So they had 120 million years of competition with dinosaurs, and they never made the slightest move towards displacing them. It's only been 65 million years since, so I assume if that extraterrestrial object hadn't hit, and for whatever reason triggered the extinction of dinosaurs, the dinosaurs would still be around. As I said, it's only been half the period of their previous domination since their death. And if that was so, I presume mammals would still be little creatures in the nooks and crannies of their world. You therefore would not have involved, evolved mammalian intelligence, which requires a big enough body to get a big enough brain to be anything like us. There's no reason to think the dinosaurs were moving in that direction. Speculative notions are just awash in the same bias of progress. No, I think if that object hadn't hit, it'd still be a world of dinosaurs, and we wouldn't be sitting in this lovely jazz club discussing this today. And that brings us to extinction. There are different kinds of extinction. So background extinction is the gradual loss of species due to normal evolutionary processes. Well, similarly, we also have natural events, but they can be bigger than that, and we call those mass extinctions. And mass extinctions are when a great number of species disappear in a relatively short amount of time. And as far as we know, there's been five mass extinction events in the history of life on Earth. The most recent one that we are all familiar with is the extinction of the dinosaurs. 
There used to be some debate on how that happened, but now we are pretty well aware that there was an asteroid that came down and it hit the Earth somewhere around the Yucatan in Mexico. And that crater is the Shikshulub crater. You can see here where that crater exists. A lot of that crater exists underwater. And the part of it that occurs on land isn't very obvious, which is probably why it took such a long time for us to find it. What's interesting about this area where uh, the, the meteor hit or the asteroid hit is that the ocean there is very shallow. And there's also a lot of sandstone. And so it has this really unique geological characteristic that makes it a pretty bad spot to be hit by a meteor. So here is a, a taxonomic tree showing all the different genera of dinosaur. Some of these you can see went extinct, but some of them did not go extinct until this certain event, this certain timeline. And you can see this whole branch of dinosaurs, all, all of the branches stopped except for one. And that was the birds. The birds are theropod dinosaurs, and some of them survived, and they continued to radiate after this event. But all other groups of dinosaurs went extinct. So this is a model of when that meteor hit. It hit that sand, and when it hit that sand, it had such an incredible impact that the Earth behaved as though it was liquid. This was an incredibly violent event. When it hit, it threw sandstone to one side, and then on that side, you can see there was a turning over of the sediment. There's a turning over of the sandstone, and it all got kind of disrupted and reorganized. Another interesting thing that happened, and we'll watch that again, is right in the center, you can see there's an ejection of material that goes up. That ejection of material put particulate, put silica into the atmosphere. That material that got ejected into the atmosphere, well, that eventually came back down and formed these little spheroids, these little spheres that burned as they came through the atmosphere and increased the air temperature to a point where trees and forests burst into flames, animals were incinerated. It's very hot. But another thing that was very interesting about that impact, and we're talking about the impact itself, is that that sandstone to one end of the impact, right? So we just watched as the meteor hit, it throws sandstone over. That sandstone that gets thrown over is all now disrupted. It's all kind of like loosened up and it's not like the sandstone that was there before because before it was all compact and it was it was um, more dense. But now it's been turned over. So that sandstone on the far end of that impact is now looser. As rainwater comes down, it gets eaten away easier by the rainwater than the other sandstone that was not disturbed. And as the water eats away at that sandstone, it creates these channels and this network of caves. These networks of caves, because they're filled with sandstone, they, they filter the water out and the water is incredibly clear. And a lot of these caves, as, as uh, rainwater kind of erodes these caves, a lot of these caves actually end up meeting the ocean and forming this incredible network of pools and openings and rivers that are throughout the Yucatan. We call these cenotes, but these cenotes are a product of the sandstone being thrown around by this asteroid. So if you look at where these cenotes occur, the crater becomes a little more apparent. Here's a map of all the different cenotes, and cenotes are those pools, those sandstone pools that lead to tunnels. If you look at a map of all the openings to the pools in Mexico, you can see in the Yucatan, you can see this ring. And this ring is forming the outer perimeter of the Shikshulub crater. On this end, you can see there's a lot more. And that's where the material was thrown. You can see all the material was thrown. And all of this was disturbed when that meteor impacted. 
And if you go to the Yucatan, you can find these openings, these cenotes, which are remnant of the outer edge of that impact. They're really, really beautiful. They're located in these tropical areas. A lot of them are a lot of them are hard to find because they're covered in forests, and a lot of them are really great places to swim. A lot of them have fish in them that have been isolated in those pools for so long that they've become distinct species. And there'll be different species in some cenotes than in others. It really is a, an incredible biological hotspot of diversity. And here's one cenote, the Gran Cenote, which is famous for being right outside Chichen Itza. And this is a cenote that was used for sacrifice by the, the peoples, the Mesoamerican peoples who built a city right around this, this Gran Cenote right here.